Abodes, and it was now Holly couldn't make it, so we had some other rockers with her, and it was it was Cassie with the long, long line, and the other rockers who were getting a little bit here and there. So, in addition to passing it along, they have very kindly invited their friend Lauren, who is her very first book as a debut author, and we're very excited. We always love having first time authors here. And she comes in, and my partner runs up to her friends who are pointing her book and say, "Oh, there's a wonderful new book. We just got it in." And you know, blah blah. And they all and they say, "Oh, we know the author." And they go, "As only can with Tammy." And they point down. <laughs> they were all calling it Tammy. So it goes yeah. way way back. <laughs>
a pair of wrought iron gates set into a high stone wall. Any Monday, in passing by, you see the thick chain that bound the gates shut, and the sign declaring the premises closed. It had been 15 years since the body was buried here, but the place itself remained as yet undesecrated. As Wilt neared the gates, something no Monday would have seen materialized out of the fog, a knocker in the shape of a hand, the finger skeletal. Will reached out with his own gloved hands and lifted the knocker, letting it fall once, twice, three times. For several long moments, nothing happened. Beyond the gates, Will saw mist, rising like steam from the ground, obscuring the grave markers and the long and even plots of earth beneath between them. Slowly, the mist began to rise and coalesce, taking on an eerie blue glow. Will put his hands to the bars of the gate. The cold of the metal seeped through his gloves and his bones. It was more than an ordinary cold. When the ghosts rose, they drew energy from their surroundings, depriving the air and the space around them of heat. The hair on the back of Will's neck prickled and stood up as the blue mist formed into the shape of an old woman in a ragged dress. Hello, Molly, said Will. You're looking fine this evening, if I do say so. The ghost raised her head. Old Molly was a strong spirit, one of the stronger Will had encountered. Even as moonlight speared through the clouds, she hardly looked transparent. William Harrendale, she said, back again so soon. Will leaned against the gate. You know I missed your pretty face? She grinned, and he saw just the skull in her half-transparent skin. Overhead, the clouds closed in, black and roiling, blocking out the moon. Idly, Will wondered what Molly had done to get herself buried here, far from consecrated ground. She chortled. What do you want, young shadow hunter? Malthus venom? Talons of a Morax demon? No, Will said. That's not what I need. I need four iodine and powders. Ground up fine. Molly paled, if a ghost could have paled, as Will spoke. Will exhaled, his breath turning to mist on the cold air. Surely, he said, that's hardly the worst thing anyone's ever paid you for. It was always like this. She pretended to argue, but she gave it eventually. Magnus had already sent Will to Molly several times, once for black stinking candles that stuck to his skin like tar, once for the bones of an unborn child, and once for a bag of fairy eyes that dripped blood on his shirt. She slid her hands into the pouch at the front of her apron. When she removed them, she was holding a faded cloth bag tied in a scrap of dirty ribbon. This is a trap, isn't it? Some kind of trick. This is, you never will catch me selling this sort of stuff, and it's the stick for me it is. You're already dead, Will said. I don't know what you think the clay could do to you now. Ha, her hollow eyes gleamed. The presence of the silent brothers can hold the living or the dead. Will held his hands up. This is no trick. Surely you must have heard the rumors of now running around Downworld. The clay has other things on its mind than tracking down ghosts who traffic in demon power and fairy blood. He leaned forward. I'll give you a good price. He drew a cambric bag from his pocket and dangled it in the air. It clinked like coins rattling together. They all fit your description. An eager look came over her dead face. She solidified enough to take the bag from him. She plunged one hand into it and brought her palm out full of rings. Gold wedding rings. Old Molly, like many ghosts, was always looking for that talisman, that lost piece of her past that would allow her to die. In her case, it was her wedding ring. It was common belief Magnus had said to Will that the ring was long gone, buried under the silty bed of the Thames. But in the meantime, she'd take any bag of found rings on the hope one would turn out to be hers. So far, it hadn't happened. She dropped the rings back in the bag, which vanished somewhere on her undead person, and handed him a full chest shade of powder in return. He slipped it into his jacket pocket just as the ghost began to shimmer and fade. Hold up, that's not all I've come for, Molly. Very well. What else do you want? Will hesitated. This was not something Magnus had sent him for. It was something he wanted for himself. Love potions. Molly screamed with laughter. Love potions? For you. It's not my way to turn out David, but anyone who looks like you doesn't need a love potion, and that's a fact. No, Will said. I, I was looking for the opposite, something that might put an end to being in love. I hate your potions. I was hoping for something more like indifference or a toleration potion. <laughs> she made a snorting noise. I hardly like to tell you this, Nephilim, but if you want a girl to hate you, there's easy ways of making that happen. You don't need my help. <laughs> and with that, she vanished, spinning away from the mist among the graves, Will looking after her side. Not for her, he said, under his breath, though there was no one to hear him. For me. <laughs>